So good afternoon. I'm Jen Dirks, President and CEO of Tempo Milwaukee. Today's Tempo Talks is focused on small business support. Thank you to all of our Tempo members, our Emerging Women Leaders, and several guests today that have joined us for our webinar. We trust you are staying safe and healthy during this challenging time for everyone. For those of you new to our call today, allow me just a brief um, few minutes to talk a little bit about our Tempo Talks webinars. We launched these a few weeks ago to feature our Tempo Milwaukee members from a variety of different industries, uh, sharing their advice, their expertise, their guidance on all things COVID-19 related. Our hope was that these Tempo Talk webinars will keep our members engaged, they'll keep them educated and informed and it really uh, goes to the importance and strength of a network of Temple Milwaukee and how we should all be leveraging it now more than ever. And so these Temple Talks serve as one of those ways to engage with our members and connect with our members. So thank you again for tuning in to today's session. Before we introduce our wonderful and esteemed panelists, I want to turn it over for a couple of housekeeping items. For those of you joining Zoom or for the first time joining one of these webinars, we have muted all of our attendees and we have disabled the camera and audio application for um, those on the webinar today. You should see me as well as our panelists uh, who will lead today's discussion along with a PowerPoint presentation and a few slides that will help carry us through uh, this conversation today. We heard from a couple of you when you registered for the event with uh, several questions for our panelists. In addition, should you have a question for our panelists during the webinar, feel free to use the chat function. I know some of you are already on that this afternoon, as well as the Q&A, drop us a question and we will get to that um, as best we can throughout the hour that we have. We have several questions lined up and there is no lack of content for today's session. So with that, I'm going to start by introducing our keynote panelists today. First, beginning with Wendy Bauman. She is the president and chief visionary officer. This is like one of the greatest titles, Wendy. So she is with the Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation, or uh, as we like to call it, and easier for everybody to remember WIBIC. So in her 27th year at the helm of WIBIC, Wendy is an internationally recognized leader in micro enterprise, small business development, financial capability, and social enterprise. With her leadership and vision, WIBIC has grown from a $200,000 budget with a staff of two to an $8 million organization with 63 staff members, five regional offices, and a rural satellite office. With over 30 years of impact, WIBIC has directly lent over $76 million in micro and small business loans with a current loan portfolio of $22.8 million and 551 active borrowers. Really impressive stats, Wendy. Um, that's really a, a, a true, true testament of your leadership. Uh, gifted advocate and coalition builder, Wendy has tirelessly lent her business savvy, compassion, and leadership skills to positively changing our economic landscape. Tempo is so very fortunate to have Wendy on our membership roster. She joined Tempo in 1994. Welcome, Wendy. Our second panelist today is Inga Plotz. Inga serves as Senior Vice President and Executive Business Development Officer for Old National Bank of Wisconsin. In her role, she represents all major business lines and advises clients on strategic business matters. Old National's presence is centered among the state's dynamic markets of Milwaukee, Madison, and the Fox Valley. Prior to joining ONB in 2018, Inga spent more than 13 years within finance, accounting, and commercial insurance. She's also the co-founder of Pump Hero LLC, which is a mobile app that connects on-the-go nursing mothers with safe, clean, and convenient locations to pump. A native of South Africa, Inga speaks four languages, including Afrikaans, French, and Zulu. Inga joined Temple Milwaukee in 2017. Welcome, Inga. Thank you. And finally, our third panelist is Megan Slocum. Megan is a vice president in the North American Commercial Bank at BMO Harris Bank. Megan joined the organization in 2014 as a relationship manager working with middle market clients in Wisconsin. 
In 2017, Megan accepted a position to lead the salesforce.com implementation for the North American Commercial Bank at BMO. Shortly after the salesforce.com project was completed, Megan moved into a newly created position leading salesforce.com strategy and execution for the U.S. Commercial Bank. In this position, she worked closely with her counterpart in Canada to drive salesforce.com strategy for the North American Commercial Bank. She serves on the board for COA Youth and Family Centers and Sharp Literacy, where she's also the board secretary. Megan joined Temple Milwaukee in 2016. A virtual applause and welcome to each of our panelists today. So a unique feature to begin each of our Temple Talks before we dive into the, the real meat of today's session is I've asked um, uh, each of our leaders or our panelists in the spirit of staying positive through all of this uncertainty is to share their personal mantra or motto or something that is serving as a motivation for them, especially during this challenging time. So with that, I'm going to get begin with Wendy. Wendy, share with us your mantra. Sure. And I, I think that's an interesting question. I like that you start out these sessions with that. So um, mine is yes to try to get to yes on everything that we can, specifically during these unprecedented times. So with Wibbit, can we get yes to that loan? Yes to more resources. Yes to more business support. Yes to more financial capability guidance. Um, so that's what it is. It's yes, try to get to yes. You are a yes woman. I, I know you quite well in the office that we share or the office park that we share at Cliff Spark. So you are definitely a yes woman. So thank you for sharing that. Inga, what is your personal mantra? My personal mantra is to continue to build resilience. I recently watched a couple of YouTube videos um, by, hosted by a psychologist from Wharton called Adam Grant. And the definition of resilience that I really, really have hinged on is the speed and strength of your response to adversity. And I think that just resonates so nicely right now in this environment, but also going forward. And being in an environment where adversity can be anything from work, family, how are you going to get to that, Wendy's point, how are you going to get to that yes and move forward? So building resilience is something that, that is a mantra for me now. Awesome. So we have a yes woman and building resilience. And Wendy, or uh, Megan, that leads to you. What is your personal mantra? Um, I love this question too, and there were so many that I could have thrown out there, but what I landed on was embrace the chaos. So, you know, my husband and I, like many of you, are um, in a lot of new job responsibilities within our household. So, you know, we joke that we're IT support and we're teacher, teaching assistants and we're chefs to what sometimes feels like a village when we're a family of four. Um, you know, last week I became the chief hairstylist for our family. So <laughs> it's really about, you know, finding the positive and the joy in a situation that can be really disheartening. And, you know, when we look back at this time, what do we want to remember? And so it's just staying focused. And I, I do think ultimately that we're going to treasure so many memories that we've made during this time. I thank you so much for each of you for sharing that. Megan, there are so many people I'm sure on this webinar that can relate. In fact, it's one of the um, upcoming topics is how you're navigating work, life, and this new normal um, at, at home and, and trying to juggle all these new, um, new skill sets. So thank you for sharing. Thank you each of you for sharing your personal mantra. So why don't we get started? Um, we're really focusing on today's topic of small business support. And we know that the coronavirus is really affecting small businesses in a variety of ways. We've seen its impact from the loss of business to business owners trying to navigate this new normal and things are changing at a rapid pace, it seems, hourly, even sometimes by the minute. And businesses are, are forced um, to be adaptive and be creative. So I want to start with you, Wendy, and if you could maybe give us a brief overview and set the stage of what things are looking like for small businesses uh, today. Sure, well, it's difficult, we all know that. It is sort of the, the first news that we're hearing since this all began was really about the health epidemic. And then shortly after that, and usually and after that, is about the economic crisis. So we've already weathered previous economic crises, 2007, 2008. We remember that well, and we can remember how that all worked, but this is coupled with the health crisis along with an economic 
crisis. Obviously, today we're going to talk on the economic piece. So a small business is huge. You know, 85% of the businesses in the state of Wisconsin are really micro businesses and small businesses. So small businesses are huge in our nation and huge employers also. So if that small business goes south, you know, that employment piece goes south and it has so many, many ripple effects. So the Small Business Administration is that arm of federal government that helps support from a federal side small business. And you have the slide out right now about the disaster loan. I think it's good to maybe start there and then talk about some of these other loans that are out there right now. And we can talk then generically about resources for small business. The SBA disaster loan has been around for a long time and something that has often been used, but hardly ever in a case of a health epidemic. It's usually a tornado, a flood, a hurricane. And it's where they take this SBA product, which is a long-term patient capital loan at relatively low interest rate. It actually is um, uh, approved by the SBA, you know, with often financial, uh, in, uh, financial institution support behind it. So these loans can go on for 30 years. For a business, it's 3.75% uh, interest rate. For a nonprofit, can also leverage these loans at 2.75%. So one of the first things that happened when this was all going on is Governor Evers uh, declared the entire state a disaster zone. So that would allow any business in the state of Wisconsin to apply for these disaster loans. And many did, many have, and many are still looking at those. But that is a certain model. It's a tool that SBA has had before. And overall, you're gonna to have to have still a lot of your documentations and a lot of your materials in line. So for example, WIBIC, who focuses on women, people of color, lower wealth individuals, veterans, military connected families, you know, and are more in that startup nature and also more in those smaller businesses and uh, looking at it a very different box. A bank would look at this box on a credit decision. Wibbick looks at this box on a credit decision. Many of our, loan, of our clients right now, if they applied for this SBA disaster loan, they would not be approved. It's just not gonna fit in that box, but it does fit in the box for many. So that was one of the first products that was put out there before and prior to the CARES Act. And it's a very, very, very good product to still look at. Doesn't take a lot to apply for it, but again, you have to have your financial household in order because it will ask you for you know, the basics on your finances. Do you want me to move a little bit into some of the new loan products then? Please do, yeah, that would be great. Okay. So then again, we've heard a lot, the CARES Act, as probably everybody knows, is the first stimulus package that came out is called the CARES Act. I think they're calling the second one that the president is signing today, CARES Act II or what have you, there's some other names for it. But basically that was the first stimulus package. And in that, there were a lot of different things that affected many different parts, but probably the one that's out there in the news a lot and a positive and on a negative front are the uh, 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 PPP. The, um, well, I can't even think where my P's are for, the Paycheck. Paycheck, paycheck, yep, paycheck, paycheck protection, protection yep. program, PPP. We call it at WIBIC PPP. I've said PPP so many times. So this program. So again, a very different um, model here where you would go through financial institutions. Actually, you can also previously and in the next, uh, this next round of the CARES Act, you can also go through organizations like WIBIC, and I'll talk about that later because we're an SBA community advantage lender and an SBA micro lender. We're also a certified community development financial institution, and that was opened up to those organizations. But basically what this is, is a loan that for the most part, if it fits into a certain area, it's fast tracked, it's not asking for a huge amount of information. You go to your bank and you apply for these PPP loans and they can end up being a forgivable loan if you use these funds for paychecks. So again, you can ask for X amount of dollars and if 75% of your request is for payroll and you use it then for payroll, that loan will be forgivable. The other 25% could be used for a variety of different things, uh, rent, mortgage, what have you, it's fairly loose, but 75% of the overall loan does need to be paid for payroll. So the idea here, the wisdom of the government here is to try to keep people employed. Even if businesses had laid individuals off, if they'd be willing to rehire them, get them off of unemployment, get them back working in the same capacity or something else, that's what these dollars are for. As everybody knows, um, this went out and it was oversubscribed and it hit systems and banks were working. We could talk about BMO and, and Old National were working 24 seven, doing just hundreds and hundreds, thousands and thousands of thousands of these loans. 
So they went out there, oversubscribed, there's still a waiting list. And now with this next one, everybody's gonna have a wonderful weekend again because all the banks and bankers and loan officers are gonna be back at work doing these PPP loans for the next round. Um, these loans can be funded fairly quickly. There's a variety of things that are asked for. So again, you need your financial house in order in terms of you know, having information about your payroll, how much that is, what the use of the funds are, a variety. But it is not a huge application process. And again, the financial institutions can comment here on it. And then actually they can be funded in a very short period of time. The SBA sort of says approval and funding within 10 days. Most of the banks that I've spoken with, they're being funded within two days. So again, very, very fast. After six months, again, the uh, business would say, yes, I did use this for payroll. C, yes, I did use this like this. And then again, be, could be forgiven. If for whatever reason, they weren't able to use it for that, it turns into a loan, but a very, very positive loan in the sense that it's 1% loan dollars. So there's still a little bit of a safety net for that PPP program. A lot of things, don't wanna go down the rabbit hole, but there are some other programs out there, an IDLE program for SBA, and these were sort of grant dollars. Again, you could apply for IDLE if you received that and say you got the five or $10,000 through that IDLE program, then you applied for PPP. That would just come off the top of PPP. Um, so you can't sort of double dip in that area, but you still can. Um, you can get also a disaster loan fund and then get a payment uh, paycheck protection program loan. So those are all details that certainly any of us offline later could speak with anybody on more detail. There's a lot of FAQs out on it and a lot of pieces, but that's the basic essence of that. And you know, I would say overall, it's very positive. I think we learned a lot of things through that first round. Again, you've heard in the news, some of the really large quote, small businesses giving their money back because what this really is about, it really is about for the smaller business. You know, the business with handfuls of employees, under a hundred employees, you know, that really, really, really need this kind of capital. You know, not your big monster corporations that still can officially fit in the parentheses under a small business. So I think it's very meaningful, it's very important. So that's some of the items on really the CARES Act and those programs. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I, I thank you. There are just so many things, um, comments. We at Temple were fortunate to complete the process. Um, I believe in day one, we had had our application in and worked with um, a local bank here and getting that turned around. And you had commented on the the 10 day, uh, you know, um, retrieval or starting to see those, those funds. So that is certainly the case with Tempo as well. And I, you kind of talked a little bit about Wendy phase one. So, you know, there was this um, effort and it was almost inundated. Uh, the system was inundated. We ran out of money. Then yesterday it was announced. It, I believe there's another $310 million in additional funding. Um, so, you know, one of the questions that was coming up and that I heard is for those that maybe didn't uh, get their application uh, approved or in the mix for phase one, our, um, you know, maybe still organizations that are completing their applications for phase two. What, what is your sense with that and what might be your advice for those businesses? Apply, apply yesterday, apply now, get in line, apply, 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 apply. You know, really, it sounds funny, but it's not. You've got to apply, you've got to get things in order, you've got to be set for this, and that's nonprofits alike, as well as the for-profits, to be able to take advantage of something like this. Be clear on the use of the funds. Again, I guess the worst case scenario, if you don't use it for that, you're getting a low interest loan. But if you, you know, are read up on it, see how these monies are used, it can be a forgivable loan. So again, you really need to apply. Work with your local bank and financial institution. I'm sure they'll give you the time of day and walk you through it. Inform yourself. Again, great information we're going to have to share after this that's posted on fact sheets. You can turn to any of us here on this panel also locally. Yeah, so a lot of, I mean, a lot of the headlines have really focused on the PPP and, um, you know, and I want to come back to that, but I, I want to maybe take a, another step back and bring in Inga and Megan into this conversation. Um, but, but first, you know, Wendy, you commented on some of the resources. You shared a little bit about the resources that Wibic is providing to its clients. Can you touch specifically on some of the things that you're doing? And then I want to highlight, I'm just going to, I'm going to share one of the programs that I just love. And I, I want to um, talk about your treat, your uh, love, your treat yourself campaign. So we'll maybe highlight that, but share a little bit about the resources to your Wibic clients. 
Yeah, what we did when this all hit is, I mean, last year, Wibbix saw over 5,000 really unduplicated clients through our business and financial education programming, and 85% of those were on ground, 15% online, on demand. We realized we needed to be safe and keep our clients safe and our staff safe. We flipped everything to virtual training. Uh, online and on demand. And so it was good we had that core competency already. So that's one thing we did. We're obviously modifying a lot of that curriculum, how to deal with the business stress, how to apply for things. We did quick down and dirty YouTubes, how to apply for IDLE, how to apply for PPP, um, how to apply for some of the other loan programs. So a lot of business information, educational programming for Wibbick is they are really, really focusing again on those micro and small businesses, very usable, very accessible. The second, we immediately created two fast and furious loans. We call them the fast track loans. Just simple, we need this much information from you to be able to approve a $15,000 term loan. Um, and we need this much information to do a $10,000 line of credit. So again, getting money into business owners quick, the need for that capital, ask this basic information and help them out. So that was something else that uh, we've put out there. Again, all that's on our website. And then also the state of Wisconsin, <clears throat> there was some news out that WDC created a $5 million fund initially. It's called WDC 2020. They uh, let that out to CDFIs, community development financial institutions in the state of Wisconsin that do small business and micro lending. We applied for it. We actually applied for the full $5 because we could have used it. But we were awarded $2 million. And so that is very helpful in that that went out to over almost 285 of our current loan clients because that's how those monies were set for current loan clients of CDFIs throughout the state. We partnered with the Hmong Chamber. We partnered with CAP Services and Stevens Point, And we were able to provide direct grants of up to $20,000 to again, cover payroll expense and cover uh, mortgage payments if they own the building or rent payments. So that was a huge relief to these hundreds of businesses. You know, again, Missy Hughes, executive director of WDC said, it's a drop in the bucket, I wanna get more, but that drop in the bucket is very meaningful for those 300 okay. plus businesses plus the other partners. So we're taking any tool we can to try to help not only our current loan clients, but future uh, clients that need our support and small businesses out there. Yeah, as Wendy mentioned, we'll share the Wibic, uh, um website and, and the link to all of these materials. But I, I would say, you know, just even going out to your website a couple of days ago and doing some research, it's full of a lot of education and resources for clients and small business owners. So really wonderful stuff. Um, I'm going to bring in Inga and Megan from the banking perspective, because I know each of your um, organizations and your institutions are providing resources as well. Inga, I just want to, you know, mention that you you are not um, you have you have said you're not a, a, an expert on COVID-19, but you know, sharing old national resources and and more importantly, maybe your um, response to what you're hearing from your clients. So, if you could maybe just share a little bit about the, some of the small business resources Old National is offering. Sure. Thank you. So we, as many companies, have created a, um, a page, a landing page that has up-to-date information with regards to what is available to small businesses and what we have done to support clients as well as case studies. And that is in the slides, uh, near the end of the slides for that address. I would say some of the critical conversations that we have been having is making sure that we're available to our clients and making sure that we're having tactical conversations about what our clients can do today to position for a resilient future. Um, one, of, one of the things that we encourage our clients all the time to do is pull together your resources, make um, decisions with as much information as you can gather and make sure that those partners that you surround around your table whether it's legal, uh, accounting, um, make sure that they're, they're bringing you the advice that you need to make decisions with confidence and to understand what you have access to. Many companies have access to the PPP, but decided not to move forward with it because they didn't need it and they knew it was for, for other purposes. But as we said earlier, if some companies weren't able to access the funds because they were depleted, continue down the path, continue down the process and make sure that your banker is holding your hand through, throughout that process and that they're being responsive. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you, Inga. And, and same question to you, Megan. I, I know that 
um, you know, just taking it from the perspective of the, the bank's resources and BMO's resources and what your response has been to your client's needs. Can you share a little bit about what BMO has been doing? Yeah, absolutely. And the link in the deck um, provides a landing page for a lot of the information that I'm going to talk about, but we're supporting our commercial clients on a more tailored basis. So that could include, you know, loan forgiveness or um, additional access to capital from a consumer standpoint. I know the focus here is more on businesses, but there's also, you know, a hardship relief process for BMO clients that's outlined uh, on the website because as businesses are impacted, so are individuals. Um, and so is the community, frankly. So um, in addition to what BMO is doing as we work with our clients, um, we're also providing additional support to the community through the COVID-19 um, relief fund that the uh, United Way stood up. And um, there's also a lot of great information on the, the website posted here as it relates to insights from our strategists and our economic economists, excuse me, from mm -hmm. a more like macroeconomic level, as well as an industry specific level, because there's a lot of different impacts depending on what industry you're in. And so um, there's great information there. Uh, like Inga said, the most important thing is really to reach out to your banker and access the resources of the bank through the person that's managing your relationship. Yeah, thank you for that point. I, again, we will share uh, just uh, all three of these organizations have really a robust amount of resources on each of their websites and um, we will definitely provide that at the end of this webinar. So Inga, I wanna go back to something that you mentioned and maybe talk a little bit um, specifically um, you're, so much of your work is around building relationships with your clients and, and meeting them in person. And now that's, that's not the, the climate or not the environment. And, and what does that virtual relationship look like? And how are you engaging with your clients now? Yeah, I think that that, that is for everybody. I think that has been the biggest shock and the biggest um, pivotal point is not being able to sit down with clients face to face and, and, and be out in the market or you know supporting your clients. The, the one thing that I have really appreciated in this, this period is when, when you do reach out, you have to understand that you're meeting your client, whether it's that individual or whether it's the company, where they're at. And that might be dealing with some really harsh decisions that they have to make, or it might be a very anxious period for them. But being available and having tactical uh, points of, of support and resources that are very concise, but also very tailored to their industry, their situation, um, ha I found to be powerful because you also don't wanna over uh, inundate your clients with information that might just become white noise. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that is, it's a very tough balance to to strike well, but I think open communication, always being available, being accessible and having tailored guidance for whether it's an industry question or whether it's a specific structural question or whether it's a personal question. Uh, that is, I've, I've found that when reaching out to people, now is about the, 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 a good time where people are, are calling back and responding and asking deeper questions because I think People have gotten their feet under them a little bit more, but it's also finding that balance of understanding where where your client is and meeting them there. Yeah, thank you, Inga, for that. And I, I'm just curious too, Megan, from your point of view, what is BMO? You know, is it along the same lines of what you're hearing from your clients? And you know, are they where where maybe are their biggest pain points? And and where is their levels of frustration or stress coming from? Yeah, you know, I think to the, the comment that I made earlier when I was talking about our website and kind of different uh, impacts for industries, it the concerns can vary greatly depending on where a company was before this all started, what industry they're in, what their financial position was prior to this, how their supply chains being impacted, uh, their access to capital. Uh, so there's a very wide variety of challenges that companies may be encountering here. Um, 
I'd say across the board, what we're hearing is consistent themes would be, you know, how do I protect my workforce? How do I keep them safe? That's why all of our friends that are labor and employment attorneys are so busy right now, right? It's how do I protect employees um, and, and do the best for them if we're, especially when we're making the tough decisions about potentially laying people off or furloughing them. Um, it's how do I maintain liquidity? So it's potentially looking at renegotiating terms with uh, suppliers and customers for payments and receivables to try to extend cash flow. And what's so interesting about where we are right now is we came into this so quickly. So with other recessions potentially or financial crises that have come in the past, there's been a little bit more of a lead up to this. And so we're coming into this so abruptly and we had a lot of companies that were so cash rich and not borrowing a lot. So it's, how do we um, create liquidity where we didn't before? So, you know, you may have a company that put a piece of big piece of equipment on a line of credit. And so it's refinancing that or thinking about a sale lease back um, to create working capital capacity. So um, those are all, I would say, consistent themes that we're hearing from our clients. Um, but a lot of it can be very industry specific. And then as you would imagine, um, a big concern is just sort of the unknown, right? How long yeah, is this sure. going on? How do we, how do we manage to this? Um, so when you think about a business cycle and booking out um, kind of what, what you're expecting, we may not see an impact this quarter, but next quarter or the quarter beyond, it's how do we, how do we get back up and running? Yeah, a couple of the, the trends and maybe the key phrases that I've heard and everyone's heard is we're all in this together. So we're all trying to figure out this together. And I think one of the um, best pieces of advice that I heard in a webinar is to have those calls and have those conversations rather than just think, you know, well, I'm not going to, if, if I reach out to my bank, um, you know, they are there to support and they are going to be a partner with you. And so encouraging small businesses to reach out to their trusted advisors and really have those those tough conversations and and know that you know I think we all have the best intentions to help everybody get get through these these challenging times so really great from that perspective Wendy I want to I want to um, come back to you because I don't want to get away from one of these resources that you provide to your WIBIC clients and and I think we're seeing it too with our Temple family. And I mentioned it at the beginning of the webinar about the strength in numbers of this network and that we are a Temple and an EWL family. And this was really to me in this campaign that you did with your um, Treat Yourself campaign, um, supporting local restaurants and supporting many of your WIBIC clients. Can you talk a little bit about that campaign, how it evolved, and then almost this twi twist of not only treat yourself, but maybe treat your friends and your family and your coworkers. So talk a little bit about that. Sure, well at Wibbick really we've always put our clients front and center. And so for a long time, we've had a client resource directory right online. And so when people say, how else can I help? You know, ha ha ha, send money. But also how you can help is buy from our clients. If our clients are successful, we'll be successful in the work and can continue to work with other clients. So we have a client resource directory right on our website you can go to. But under these circumstances right now, we thought, how can we help these businesses even further? So there's some that are a little bit easier to help in some ways, you know, and it really does range. I mean, we have construction companies, we have trucking companies. Some of these are doing quite well and are, are weathering things okay, so it really varies. But the restaurants, hard hit. Uh, mm -hmm. Retail, hard hit. So those are two specific ones that we're really trying to assess. So most of the restaurants, not all, but many of the restaurants have been able to pivot and provide curbside uh, package meals, so on and so forth. So we thought, well, we could certainly help them get that out there. And we have restaurants all around Wisconsin, many, many, many in Milwaukee area. I know you're gonna share with Temple members that later. So we're just trying to make it as easy as possible for you, link to their website, know how they're available, how you can order. And the thought is not only yourselves, do you want, maybe you need a little break. Megan mentioned that, you know, she's the chief chef. Maybe she <laughs> treats everybody to pizza at one of our long clients or empanadas at another one or what have you some evening. You know, still being able to do that for your family, but not also to forget about friends and associates. What a lovely gift to a coworker, an employee, is to have a meal delivered and dropped off, again, from a WIBIC client kind of business. 
So really thinking about food in that way, we all still need to eat. When things begin to open up and the world open up, I think you want to go back to your favorite coffee shop still, but it needs to be there and it needs support during that time. You want to go back to your favorite restaurant in your favorite spot because that's really where memories are made and life is experienced in so many ways. And in addition, also the retail. Um, looking at that, looking at buying gifts, looking at buying gift cards, all of that, it really, really can make a difference as a lifeline. So we did a WIBIT. We've been working now five weeks virtually with our folks. Every single week for our staff of 60 plus, we're sending a WIBIT client gift. So I think the first week we did nuts from um, Nutcracker in Madison. Um, this last week we did Miss Cupcake and everybody got crispy bars and brownies and a cupcake. Uh, we did candles, we did soap, we got some other things going. So again, our team of 60 plus are working at home, working like fools, working three hours more than they probably generally have been working, amazing amounts. And so as an employer, we're also providing that gift and saying, you know, here you go, a little treat that's coming your way, especially for people that don't necessarily have a large family, whatever, to have something like that go is great. So I would encourage all of my fellow Tembo members to look at that, think about it, buy something for yourself, but also think about friends, families, and associates, your employees, your coworkers, that really can help out these small businesses until they're really able to open again. Yeah, that's really wonderful. I love this Treat Yourself campaign, um, just a little bit. Uh, personal that I, I can share as well as, um, you know, we're doing our part here. I live in a downtown third ward condo building and a couple of nights a week, I have been crowned the DoorDash, uh, you know, person or expert for my condo unit and send out a menu from all local restaurants and take orders and then deliver them to the condo units in my building. So this has been one way that we can show support for local um, and I love this this retail aspect of it as well. So thank you, Wendy, for sharing that. And we, again, will share that list of WIBIC clients, but um, there's a whole host of other websites that really have the list of um, curbside pickups and those restaurants that uh, really need our support now more than ever. Um, so uh, before we kind of switch, I want to ask a couple of questions, PPP related to Inga and Megan, but encourage those again on our call. If you have a question for Wendy, for Inga, uh, for Megan, please use the chat function or the Q&A. We have a couple of questions that are coming in and we'll hopefully address them um, after uh, just a couple of more questions that I have for Inga and Megan. So Inga and Megan, let's get back to a little bit more. Uh, Wendy talked about the PPP and the application process. I know banks were inundated. I think there were 2,400 financial institutions providing this PPP applications. Um, you know, Inga, maybe start with you from Old National and supporting your clients in the application process. Maybe first from the ONB perspective and what the application process, how it went. Say, wow. When, uh, when I look at Old National Bank, we actually, now, now think of it, it, this is something that happens so quickly and we, we received the stimulus packet and all of a sudden the banks were going to have to accept applications, help clients figure that out. And I think there was something like a week's lead time. So imagine a $20 billion organization that is publicly traded and has locations in five states to, to answer to that and to be able to support their clients in that fashion. Old National actually redeployed, retooled and realigned one third of all of our employees to be able to serve our clients in this in this way, which is a big, massive undertaking. But we, at the end of, of the first wave, we I think um, processed about over six thousand applications. We deployed over one point three five billion dollars for our clients to support them in the in the first wave of the PPP, and that took hours and hours and hours of long hard work but it took handholding for our clients as well. The, we prioritized our clients. We did not take any new applications from new clients. We just weren't in a position to do that, but we certainly advised some, some companies that reached out to us and gave them resources and redirection. But for an organization to be able to pivot 
or be that agile is is quite an under, undertaking and has been incredibly, you know, something that makes me incredibly proud. Uh, we receive an email from our CEO on a daily basis, and every email includes client notes of thanking us and just reflecting on what what could have been a very stressful and um, massively impactful situation was something that they felt confident and and comfortable in working with us. And that that speaks volumes of being able to move so quickly. Um, I think the one thing that was frustrating for, for clients is there was so much that happened so fast that was so ill-defined. Yeah. And we, we were one of the last banks to actually accept applications because we wanted to make sure that we understood what was expected and asked of our clients. But once we had our portals open, everything went, went really smoothly. So just knowing that there's so un such uncertainty, but knowing that you're partnering with the, the, the right organization or have access to resources and, and conversations, um, was we, we've received just great feedback from all clients. That's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, just to your point, it speaks a lot to um, the agility and, you know, being flexible from an ONB perspective and, and being able to, you know, respond quickly. So, uh, Megan, I'm going to ask you the same question about the, the PPP application process from BMO's perspective, um, maybe, you know, from what you kind of went through internally to what you might have been hearing from your clients or still hearing from your clients. Yeah, and um, I would echo a lot of what Inga brought up as it relates to the velocity with which this was launched. So I think um, I heard a statistic that really um, provides good visibility into what we were dealing with here. So between 2005 and 2015, the SBA deployed 20 billion in loans. And if you think about when the PPP program was approved or the CARES Act was approved to the time that the money was made available and then ran out, less than a two week period, 350 billion. So that was a, a huge um, mobilization effort for the bank. Um, and I think it's, just a testament to what everybody is going through, right? You're changing how you do business based on what's going on now. So we had a handful of people that would have been processing SBA loans. Mm -hmm. And now we have a hun like a couple hundred people that have been trying to pull this through. And so overall, we processed around 4.4 billion, um, 1.1 billion to 2,800 borrowers went within the state of Wisconsin. So you know, we, we stood up a process really quickly. I think our median loan size was around 77,500. So um, I feel like we were targeting a good segment of, of people that really needed access to the capital. And there was clearly a demand for it based on how quickly this ran out. I expect that the next phase of PPP is going to go very quickly based on pent up demand and what banks have within their systems. Um, and we've gotten, amazing feedback from our clients. We also get really good communication from our leadership. I feel so grateful to work for BMO as an organization because we've quickly pivoted to how do we support our customers and how do we support our employees to make them safe and to make them um, able to function and healthy mentally. Um, and so the, the feedback has been so positive from our clients in terms of the communication. There's so much uncertainty now it's obviously um, a period of great need from uh, clients. And so to be able to work through this with them has been, um, I think, amazing from just a, a corporate standpoint. There's clearly a lot more demand. So um, similar to Inga, you know, we were working with clients, borrowing, non-borrowing. Um, and I think we felt that despite the... Um, you know, some, some mountains to climb as it relates to a government program where we're more of a, a conduit to being able to get the funds to people as opposed to originating the program ourselves. But to be able to work with our customers to deliver the funds, I think overall it has gone very positively. Yeah, thank you both. I, I think this question um, from one of our attendees is, um, yeah, it, it brings up a really good point. She mentions that Several banks are no longer accepting the PPP loan apps, um, even from their existing uh, customers since their, their queue is already too long. 
um, this attendee is asking any questions, any um, suggestions that you have for, for those customers? Well, there is a listing on the SBA website that lists all of the eligible banks that can do PPP, so they might have to shop. And it's also okay that if your bank is no longer doing that, that you could go to another bank. You just have to see. You can't, you know, don't make a judgment call that they might not accept you. They might still. And you might have to apply with a variety of different banks also. It's not ideal, but that would be my suggestion. Yeah, and I would say to those too, it's obviously the PPP is preferable from the standpoint that it's a forgivable loan and that the interest rates are so low. But you know, in the event that you have a relationship with your bank and you have a plan and you can execute on it, there are other kind of conventional financing right. options available. And so, I mean, PPP is not, is not the only avenue that you could explore, although it, it is the, probably the most attractive in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's maybe the, the one that is most familiar to most, but what you're saying, Megan, is that there are some other options and, and Wendy, that, that um, SBA resource page is really great as well. So yeah, thank you. Um, Inga and Megan, and then we'll um, take a couple more questions from the attendees. Um, the greatest piece of advice you are giving your clients on how to leverage and work with their banks during this challenging time. Inga, we'll start with you. You know, I, I don't think my advice has changed in this period than what I would have advised my clients prior. Um, I always I always tell clients that they need to make sure that they understand all their options and scenarios available to them before events happen. For example, if a company is acquisitive, they need to know exactly what access to capital they have, what their limitations are, what their needs are, and the opposite as well. If there is an opportunity for them to, or a need for them to pivot, they companies need to understand that and need to kind of stress test and map out in in different scenarios, how will they react? How can their banks support them? Um, and not only their banks, all of the advisors that they, that they entrust their companies and their employees to. So I don't know if my if my counsel has changed with my clients. Obviously, there's there's some additional int introductions that have been made for specific needs right now, but I also think that the critical conversations are companies now realize who how strong their banks are or how strong their partners are, and it's there's there's a sharp divide between the two, um, and and I think it's an opportunity now for companies to truly demand more from, from who they're working with because we certainly, uh, we've certainly worked hard, um, but we're in this together and we're, we're trying to, to support our clients. Yeah, that's great. Uh, greatest piece of advice, uh, Megan, from you in terms of what you would give a company um, on how to leverage and work with their banks during this challenging time? Yeah, I would just say be completely transparent right? Bankers don't like to be surprised and we can't help you solve for problems unless we know that they're there or solve for challenges or bring the right resources. So um, it's extremely important during this time. I think the expectation is, you know, you have a plan, but information is changing very quickly right now. And the landscape and outlook is changing very quickly. So don't be shy if you've provided guidance to your bank and something changes or something gets disrupted to be able to come back to them and say, what I told you has changed a lot. Um, banks are here to support you and to bring the, or, you know, your relationship manager should be working from the assumption that he or she is an advisor to you, helping you chart your strategic plan, helping challenge assumptions, helping um, shape questions that you have and, and things that you're trying to overcome. But unless we know about those, we can't help you. So I would say transparency is key and also being able to provide the best, best information in the point in time. So, you know, you may be making an assumption today that changes a week from now based on what the government does or based on what happens here. And you just have to trust that the relationships that you've built are going to be there to support you. And if the relationship that's there to support you doesn't know what's come up, they're not going to be able to support you. So I would say 
transparency and constant communication is key over communication. I would just add Jennifer too, I think for businesses to have some scenario planning. Um, you know, we all do that all the time. You know, we're all really can be futurists, but to look at scenario planning of your classic, you know, what's my best situation that I can see right now based on the information I have, what's maybe more realistic and what's gonna be a harder situation and look at that and then certainly share that with key advisors such as bankers, you know, your accountants, attorneys, what have you. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, we did a similar exercise at Tempo. We kind of put together a, um, you know, when this was all coming out, a 60 day what if, then we built it into a 30 or a three month what if, and then even built it out to a, a six month what if. And now among those different scenarios was, okay, here's worst case scenario, here's, you know, middle market or surviving scenario, and then, you know, what's the best case scenario. And so I think, you know, there are, there are multiple templates, there are multiple templates out on Wivik sites, on um, SBA site in terms of even plunking in, you know, what your, your current assets are and, and kind of doing some forecasting from that perspective. But even I've seen that from not only the, the loan and the financial, but also from an HR perspective and uh, employee retention and, you know, all of that. So there is not um, a shortage of resources out there for small businesses. And so we can continue to provide, I think our Monday message has been a really great way of getting out information to our members. So we've enhanced that when all of the COVID-19 information came out that um, we're asking our members, if you have resources um, from a nonprofit to a small business to, um, you know, you're in the banking industry that you want us to share with our membership, we are more than happy to do so. So um, please, you know, keep us posted about what those, um, it's upcoming webinars, it's articles, it's resources. So um, please let us know. A uh, couple of questions, Wendy, for you um, that are specific for you. One of them is, um, can you share some of the innovative ways your WIBIT clients have adapted or changed their business plans due to COVID-19? Can you talk a little bit about some of the unique or creative ways your yeah. clients have well, the, the restaurants, of course, you know, really switching to not only curbside and delivery, but also thinking not just about a single meal and packaging family meals and larger meals so people can buy, you know, not having to do like four different orders, but they can get a family packet. So that's been a lot. And that, you know, takes a moment. The whole part about working virtually, we have had some sessions on that. How do you keep your employees going, working from, if you will, home or in a virtual mode? Some great there. A couple of the pivoting businesses, one that stands out, it's a Milwaukee-based business. It's a small manufacturing company on the northwest side of town. And they manufacture luggage tags, menu covers. They use plastics and leather. Have about maybe 15, 20 employees doing heavy-duty sewing. We provided a loan for a new piece of equipment for them. And guess what they're making now? Face masks and face shields. Yeah, that's awesome. So totally taking what they had. We can sew. We can do this. What do we really need to do? Import export companies that before importing export statues and other things for uh, retail or what have you. Now looking at really going internationally as well as others and providing a great Madison company um, where the state is actually purchasing huge amounts of face masks and so on that he's securing from some of his sources on an international basis. So taking some of the same business model, but switching it. So it's not only the business operations that changes, but it's also maybe the business itself. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, we've heard so much. I mean, even from the, um, the local um, distilleries that are turning their vodka now into hand sanitizer um, and, you know, just kind of looking at what um, the capabilities or what their resources are and, you know, pivoting. I, I think we use that word more often than not these days. Um, and this other question comes from you or for you, Wendy. I know you talked a lot about um, the loans provided through Wibic, but this uh, attendee was asking, how else can you work with a business owner if you do not need a loan through Wibic? Well, again, our business education courses, I think would be really good. We also have a lot of other resources too. We're trying to sort of be that middle of the hourglass. So there's a lot of communities um, uh, Dane by Local is an example just in Madison that pulled together a very, very, very large grant fund for businesses in that community. So there's just a lot of different resources we have on our website. Give us a call. We're still returning all phone calls and we can sort of guide you. But I think the business education uh, training would be one specifically that could be helpful. 
Perfect. Great. And we've got about uh, four minutes, so I want to run through um, a couple of things and then be able to tease some of our upcoming Tempo Talks. So one final, and I, I hate to keep on picking on you, Wendy, but this was uh, one of the questions that we received. Uh, people have really rally, uh, relied on online shopping and ordering during this pandemic for items other than groceries and essentials. Do you see this changing small business online shopping versus in-person shopping in the future? I think it's going to increase the online nature. I think really, I think our businesses have a better handle on it. It's increasing, but you still don't go to a friend or a partner and say, honey, let's spend the morning online shopping. Correct. Say, yeah, honey, sure. <laughs> let's spend the morning and go to some shops and do shopping. So it's with partners, friends, so on. So our world is still social and it's going to go back to many things social in slightly different ways, safer ways, especially for a while. But I do think the online nature of it will increase. And what I love so much about it is that it's not just for big box. That little box can be also very effective with online sales. Agreed. I agree. And I think, you know, you even hear it from small businesses that maybe didn't even have a presence online mm -hmm. and now because of this are now have this online presence and, and, you know, even thinking we need to sustain this beyond COVID and um, that becomes part of your business model. So I think that's really been um, one of the, maybe, maybe the blessings that has come out of this. So I'll give you time to breathe and um, regroup Wendy. So I have a same final question for all three of you is uh, maybe starting with you, Megan, how you personally are coping with this pandemic and, and um, has there been a personal coping mechanism that you use to get through these challenging times? Yeah, so, you know, I've, I think, li been listening to these COVID talks and I don't think this is a surprise like so many others, I'm trying to get outside and just breathe in air. Um, you know, you see the seasons changing and you realize things change and the period that we're in right now is going to pass us by, right? Time moves on and it's a really, really good reminder that, um, you know, even though a lot of us don't know, none of us know exactly what this is going to look like when we come out of it, we understand that this will pass us and, and that we'll come out of it. And so going back to kind of my mantra, you know, you can control what you can and embrace the chaos now to set the tone for how it is for you and for your family and your friends and the people that you're interacting with when you come out of this. So um, I just, I try to kind of find the beauty in the moment and take it one day at a time and find kind of the humor and lightness and in the experiences that we're having. It's not always easy. I'll admit mm -hmm. that, right? I mean, that's, it can be crazy, but you can find the joy and the humor in any moment. And then it's a better memory when you look back on it. So yeah. that's what I would say. And yeah. like I said before, I just feel so thankful to be working for a company like BMO that is so focused on customers, but also employees. And our leaders have been amazing at, you know, supporting employees and figuring out, you know, how we're all doing and how we're going to feel okay about where we are right now and how we're going to feel okay about what it looks like a month from now and two months from now and a year from now. So um, I can't say enough about BMO as an employer. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I'm going to pass this on to you, Inga, but maybe knowing that part of your coping mechanism has to do with a little one named Anya, maybe bringing some joy to your life each day. Yeah, um, I think a coping mechanism is, as Megan said, one day at a time because every day is different. But I feel that we are so blessed in having this this big pause, right, to to create the environment in which we are going to look back at this time with just such great memories um, and being able to be gentle with yourself and to take those moments to put her down for a nap if, if that, you know, if your, if your schedule permits that. And so it has, it, it certainly has been uh, a blessing for me and my family. And I'm very, very honored to be working for Old National Bank because we, we've had about four surveys and employee engagement is at 89%. And mm -hmm. it, it is just um, an, a great environment to be in uh, to be able to support not only clients, but employees, um, peers, as well as know that your family is is cared for. I think the other the other part that gives me 
some really positive and, and excitement is we are creating what we aspire to have as our new normal going forward. And that's, that's a powerful thing because I think if we can influence what works for us now and how we want to adjust, how we work going forward, that, that is, that's an exciting thing to be thinking about. Agreed. Yeah. Wonderful perspective. And Wendy, for you, coping mechanism. Well, I'm a home chef. And so now I'm more at home. So I'm seriously love chefing. <laughs> I love it. So a little bit over the top sometime, but each <laughs> night these meals are amazing. Amazing. What's on the menu tonight? Tonight I have a poke bowl with tuna. Ooh, and nice. um, also tum yum goon is the beginning, sort of a Thai soup. And then I have halibut that I've already seared. We'll finish off in the oven, black beans, rice, and then a orange tart for dessert. Nice. Yeah. And did I mention that I um, am picking up orders for my condo so I could <laughs> come over to your place, Wendy? Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you, all three of you, for your guidance, your expertise. I think it's been really, really wonderful. Um, as we mentioned, this is all being recorded. Uh, we do have the resources, the small business resources, all the links that Inga, Wendy, and Megan mentioned on, her, on our website. So please go to those as well. You can find each of these three fabulous women in our online Tempo directory. Um, so feel free to reach out to them if you have specific questions. Um, coming up for our Tempo Talks next week, um, Monday, or Friday, May 1st, is Navigating Work, Home, and the New Normal. So I know all three of these ladies can attest to this, but um, we've got some special guests with Amanda Baltz, um, who is raising five children at home, along with running her own company, Spalding Medical. Rebecca Ehlers from Lumen Schools, who is a, um, a working mom, but also is providing um, guidance for teachers and uh, for uh, uh, children, uh, you know, how, how they're keeping um, from uh, not going crazy in a uh, homeschooling environment. And then Latrice Knighton, who is a uh, family practice attorney, but also runs her nonprofit Back, Back to Work Mommy. So we'll hear from them. This event will actually be hosted by our new board chair, Lori Richards, who, who herself is juggling work, life, and two daughters at home. And then Friday, May 8th, I'm maintaining mental health during COVID-19. Um, a lot of what, we, what you all shared about coping mechanisms, about you know, having that mantra and trying to stay positive, this will be really the focus of that with Dr. Maria Perez from 16th Street Community, Christy Miller, who will share her own um, personal story about mental health. Um, she's with Pearls for Teen Girls. And then Ann Gibbons, who um, day job is Generac, but then um, she's also an experienced registered yoga teacher. And she will take us through about a 10 to 15 minute um, meditation session at the end of our uh, Tempo Talk on Friday, May 8th. So I encourage all of you to attend if you can, if you have any ideas uh, that you want to pass along to us for content, um, please do so. Thank you all. We ran a little over, but I do appreciate such great content. Again, thank you to our wonderful panelists. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.